Shalom, let's follow Jesus along the Talmudim way. Acts chapter 1, we're calling this one Ascension because it is the time after Jesus' resurrection. He makes an appearance to the disciples, gives them some instructions, and then he ascends with a promise that uh, they need to stay in Jerusalem and wait for some great things to happen. Father, we ask you to bless our study and have us be like the Bereans who receive the word with all eagerness, but they examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. By this study, let uh, let us be each doers of your word and not hearers only. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first major segment of the book of Acts all the way through chapter 7 is going to take place in and around Jerusalem. So we'll be fixed on these maps for a while here. Uh, this is the uh, estimated look of the boundary of the temple and the city walls around the time of Jesus and then the uh, the early uh, the early church. So we'll come back to this map to spot different locations throughout Acts uh, chapter 1 and, and the early chapters in the book of Acts. Verse 1, the first account I composed Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after he had been, after he'd given orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. In our intro, we pointed out that Luke ended his gospel with the promise of the Holy Spirit and Acts then records the fulfillment of that promise. And in, in amazing ways did uh, the Spirit pour out uh, around, around Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth so that the church ends up starting out in really locally in Jerusalem and a little bit in Galilee, really spreading all the way up through Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and then on into Europe, Greece, Rome, and then ultimately uh, beyond that. In our intro video, we pointed out that Luke is widely assumed to be the author of both Luke and Acts. Again, he ends his gospel with the Holy Spirit and then connects it there with the fulfillment of that promise. He spent time in Ephesus, and this is where the location of his, his tomb is today, the traditional location. Um, Keener notes that in two-volume works, it was customary to recap the end of one and the beginning of the other. So if you read the very end of Luke chapter 24, there's some overlap and maybe a little bit different telling from the events that we see in Acts chapter 1. But really, uh, Acts chapter 1 is gives you much greater detail. We don't really know how much time passed uh, since Luke finished his gospel and when he first started Acts. So um, Luke is kind of just recapping this for us. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things regarding the kingdom of God. If Luke and Acts were Paul's pre-trial documents, as we talked about in the intro video, and I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other that whether they are or aren't, but if they were, then the testimony of eyewitnesses, particularly of Jesus' death and resurrection, would have been especially relevant for Luke to record here. The days between uh, his resurrection and, uh, and Pentecost are, are very important. You can see they're being counted here. And that's because they're especially sacred to the Jewish people. So the first Sunday after Passover is always the Feast of First Fruits. It's always the first day of the week after Passover. And that year, Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week after Passover. So you have these references that Jesus is, is our first fruits. Um, Leviticus 23, 16 says, You shall count 50 days after the seventh Sabbath, after the Feast of First Fruits. Then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. Well, 50 days from the Sunday of First Fruits is always another Sunday. And that happens to be uh, what's called many names, the Feast of Shavuot. It begins the Feast of Weeks, and then we may know it as Pentecost. It's the Feast of Pentecost. So it's 50 days after what we would call the resurrection. Pentecost is typically associated with the barley harvest, but it is also the day when Moses received the Torah from the Lord on Mount Sinai. And we'll discuss some interesting parallels between the Exodus 19 and 20 Pentecost and then the Acts 2 Pentecost next time. So he showed many convincing proofs. We've got a lot of evidence of this back in the Gospels. 
Jesus appeared to two disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus, and we see a likely candidate for that location above. Also in John chapter 21, Jesus presented himself alive to at least seven of the apostles on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, That is uh, one of the most touching scenes in the entire Bible. It's one of my favorite locations in Israel is the traditional location where this took place because it is where Peter restored Jesus. So you got to put yourself back a little bit. Um, The night before he was crucified, Peter had denied Jesus after boasting that he would never do such a thing. And uh, he denies him three times. He goes out and weeps. Tradition says that Peter is despondent, and uh, so it's very telling that after the resurrection, the the Lord kind of pulls them aside, and they they walk along the beach, and Jesus says, how many, how many times does Jesus ask, do you love me? He asked him three times, so one for each denial. So it's a fantastic story uh, about presenting himself alive by many convincing proofs. So Jesus you know, knew what Peter had done and, and ended up restoring him. It's a great story. You need to go back and reread it sometime. Verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So it doesn't tell them exactly when. We know in hindsight it's going to be about 10 days from now at the Feast of Pentecost. When he says gathering them together, it literally means in the Greek taking salt together. This was no angelic apparition because, you know, apparition. Angels don't have a need or a desire to eat or drink, but Jesus does. And so this term implies intimate fellowship and they're they're going to hang around Jerusalem and wait for this to happen. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Don't change that channel. Kind of kind of thought is is what Jesus is communicating here. So we need to keep in mind that this is still before Acts 2, right? Sounds obvious. It's Acts chapter 1. We haven't gotten to Acts chapter 2 yet. But the point is they don't know the power of the Holy Spirit right at this moment as they would know it in a few days when we have Pentecost. So what they will know is much the same way that we experience the Holy Spirit today, but kind of it was a a bit more abstract, I think, when Jesus was telling them this. But what they were familiar with was ritual immersion, the kind of immersion that John preached for repentance. Jews would frequently immerse in a pool of living water where they would be rendered ceremonially clean, and perhaps several times a month they would have to to do this uh, before they went into to worship. Our modern baptism actually has its roots in the Jewish immersion procedures, and what they would do is, uh, if they had didn't have a river, like the Jordan River you see in the picture, they would have a pool of living water, or it's called a mikvah in Hebrew. Um, so in any case, Jesus tells them here to, re- to remain in Jerusalem and be patient. They probably weren't going to leave anyway because Pentecost is only a few days away. They're already in Jerusalem, so you know they weren't going to split after that. But it's interesting. Jesus says, really, don't go anywhere because something major is about to happen. So when they had come together, they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And, you know, 2,000 years later, it's really easy to teach those dense disciples. They still don't get it. They still don't realize that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. Well, I think that's unfair, and perhaps it's an uninformed conclusion. The prevailing belief in that day was that the Messiah was going to usher in the political kingdom. And we've taught about how they believed in two messiahs, and we would say that's one messiah with two different missions. So they believed in a messiah ben Joseph, a messiah who is going going to suffer like Joseph, which we just got done studying in the book of Genesis. And then the second messiah would conquer like King David come and and take over and establish a political kingdom. Well, think about what just happened. The suffering Messiah had just overcome his suffering, and now it's time for Messiah Ben David to rule, right? You can see here a picture of King David's traditional tomb, which curiously enough is located immediately below the upper room traditional location. So it's kind of interesting. You've got this holy spot in Judaism and this holy spot in Christianity uh, really right, literally right uh, on top of each other. The book of Revelation, which of course we have the advantage of reading, but the disciples at this time didn't have that yet, very much teaches a political kingdom. So I don't think it was an uninformed question in the least. We will see in the next verse uh, 
that although the disciples are scolded by modern commentators for being dense and not getting it, Jesus doesn't do any of this. He doesn't scold them in the slightest. He just explains it to them. So as we said in the intro section, a scholar Mark Nanos believes that Paul was basing his decision that Gentiles did not need to convert to Judaism on the fact that he, Paul, believed Messian- the Messianic age had actually dawned. And so if this belief was widespread among the disciples, then this question they just asked makes even more sense. You know, who could have foreseen a 2,000-year gap and counting between the dawning of the Messianic age and its fulfillment? They thought, well, you know, Messiah has just risen. Messiah has, has you know, is about to do something amazing. Um, could he possibly be talking about restoring the kingdom? I think it's a very logical and rational question to ask. If the age had dawned, then its fulfillment must be near. And again, who knew that it was going to be 2,000 years? Paul in his letters taught frequently that you know we, we are to expect the Lord's coming at any minute, uh, the doctrine of eminency it's called. And in any case, questioning, especially when you have Jesus uh, in front of you, is always better than assuming. So I don't think any question asked in sincerity and with a desire to understand better is a stupid one. So I, I, as you might gather, I, I'm really not on board with commentators chastising the disciples in, in this case. But he said to them, it is not for you to know the periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. And again, notice Jesus doesn't chastise the disciples for their question, so it should make us uneasy when commentators dare to go where Jesus himself does not go. Just the opposite, in fact. Appointed times in Hebrew, the word is moedim. It is a term rich with messianic meaning. So he basically tells them not yet. Doesn't even tell them no. Just says not yet. Uh, If I could paraphrase, no man knows the day nor the hour, but keep watch and be faithful and be my witnesses. That's what he's telling him here. We talked a lot about verse 8 in the intro session, so I'm not going to rehash it all here. It is our outline for the book of Acts, and it's divided into three sections, really, that take place. Uh, the first part takes place in and around Jerusalem. The second major section takes place in Samaria. And then the third major section covers the, the mission to the Gentiles to the ends of the earth, and that's just a term for the known world, i.e. the Roman Empire of that day. So the followers of Jesus would begin to spread the good news in and around Jerusalem, and they would remain there until the persecution that broke out in the aftermath of Stephen's martyrdom, and that was covered in Acts 7, and then Acts 8 talks about the the persecution. That's the the, the fourth persecution, the one that Saul himself uh, led or was, was somehow involved in. And it's often that persecution arises to get us to move to a, another place. And uh, we see that a few times throughout history, not, not the least of which is the founding of America and, and people fleeing religious persecution there. So there could be any number of reasons for, for persecution. The heart of ancient Samaria was the region of Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You can see Mount Ebal here. Mount Gerizim's off to the south in this picture. Jesus visited this area with his apostles in John chapter 4 when he spoke to the woman at the well. And that is a beautiful picture of us going into territories that are not familiar to us and ministering to them. In the intro, we also talked about how we're not necessarily called to witness, but we're called to be witnesses. We're called to be ambassadors. In John chapter 4, Jesus was an ambassador of God the Father as he ministered to the people of Samaria and really set the record straight on all the divisions that had taken place. You see the woman had some questions that, that she had been taught uh, on the Samarian traditions, and, and Jesus gently sets her straight. Uh, he does it all in love. And then finally, to the uh, furthest parts of the earth, this is a picture of the town in Greece that is Berea, and it is near uh, Thessalonica, and it's where Paul testified to the congregation that Jesus was the Messiah, and they believed the word with all eagerness, but then they went back and searched the scriptures for themselves. So today, that witness continues through this very small city that I I can't wait to visit in in a few weeks. Final thought on being his witness. Uh, Chuck Mister used to teach the commandment that says, don't take the Lord's name in vain. 
it could also be interpreted as don't take on the Lord's name in vain. And he would say it's not so much about your vocabulary, it's about your ambassadorship. How are you doing at being his witness? How are you and I doing as agents of Jesus? And how are we representing him to the world around us? So something to think about when we think of particularly of the Bereans. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were watching and a cloud took him up out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, then behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And then we'll, we'll pick it up in verse 11. So here's a map showing the approximate location of the ascension. It's on the Mount of Olives, really right at the top of the Palm Sunday Road uh, that leads down into the valley and then up, up into Jerusalem. Our friends in the Catholic and traditional Protestant denominations, they make a much bigger deal about the ascension than most Baptists and non-denominational congregations do. Many of their churches are even named ascension, uh, including one where a good friend of mine is on staff up in St. Louis. Um, it's The ascension is part of all the major church creeds. It says, he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So let's not lose sight of how significant the ascension is. There are definite parallels with this to Enoch from Genesis chapter 5, but even more so, I think, to Elijah. Um, there are four famous, what I might call, passings of the torch, torch in Scripture and each one is associated with something supernatural, so it's kind of interesting. So the first major one was Moses passing the torch to Joshua. After he commissioned Joshua, Moses died, but then it says something weird. It says the Lord personally had to bury him. And then Jude makes a comment that uh, Satan himself contended for the body of Moses. Uh, so the, you know something odd is going on that God himself had to intervene. The next big one was right at the Jordan River. Uh, Elijah was taken up, but not before passing the mantle to Elisha. Elisha. And then at that very same location, John the Baptist passes the torch to Jesus. And the spirit descended visibly, and the father, father spoke audibly when that happened uh, at Jesus' baptism. And then here we have Jesus is really passing the mantle down to the apostles. The apostles are going to carry on his work just as Elisha carried on Elijah's work and Joshua carried on Moses' work. And what happened supernatural here? Well, Jesus ascended in, in a big way, and it, you know, they were kind of stunned at, at all this was happening. The angels that were there said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. And this is an unmistakable reference to Zechariah 14.4. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west, forming a large valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north, and the other half will move toward the south. Here's a picture looking from the city of Jerusalem east. Uh, so it's a sunrise over the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is off to the east. And um, the, the next verse will tell us that Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives, the next verse in Acts. And so uh, we, we, we know pretty much where this is happening. There's also a verse in Daniel 7.13. It says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So we anxiously await his return, just as the disciples did, right? They were waiting for, for that day. It's really a lot of fun going to the Mount of Olives because you, you study what already has happened, and then you look up because you know what will happen there. It's a fun place to be. Then they returned from Jerusalem to the mountain called Olivet, the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. It's about two-thirds of a mile. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upstairs room, or the upper room as we know it, where they were staying. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. So we're missing one, notably. Uh, Peter is always listed first in any of these uh, listings of the disciples. Peter, James, and John listed one, two, and three. They were often considered the inner circle, uh, you know, Jesus's executive team or inner, you know, inner, inner circle, that kind of thing. 
so the the distance again is about a two thirds of a mile. It's in about the distance from the Ascension Mount of Olives. You go back down the Palm Sunday Road. You cross the Kidron Valley. You go up into Jerusalem and then make your way to the upper room, which today is located on uh, Mount Zion. And the mention of Sabbath day's journey is really just a, a distance measure. Uh, it's not saying that this this was a Saturday. Uh, the, the text it could have been, but the text doesn't require it. Dr. Bolin writes, the Roman Catholic Church identifies this location on Mount Zion as a place of the upper room. You can see it in the picture there. Uh, It's visited uh, by tourists today. It's a crusader structure, so the architecture is a little bit different. It's very much a a thousand years ago and not 2,000 years ago. But the tradition that this is the upper room is is very strong. Um, It's most likely the same location as the Last Supper room. We can't be 100% certain, but the the Greek does say the upper room, so it probably uh, is the same place. All these were continually devoting themselves with one mind to prayer, along with the women the Mary, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brother. So again, we have the definite article, the prayers and, and the supplication, reminding us that these were uh, devout, devout Jews, and they dil- diligently followed the liturgical prayers of the Jewish daily life. This meeting likely went on for a full week or more. They likely went to the temple for the morning and afternoon prayers and then returned to this room to continue the liturgy. It's definitely an unusual amount of time because they, they you know, Luke wouldn't have had the need to say it. But we don't have to assume the prayer was uninterrupted, you know, all day, all night. It was certainly more prayer than usual. Maybe it was several several hours a day, but they did have to eat, drink, and, and socialize. And unless the house owner was also catering the event, they might have had to spend some time doing odd jobs to support all of these people who are uh, uh, eating a lot. So note how women were considered leaders in the early church. They met the definition of apostle. They were considered apostles. We talked about that in the intro. It also says uh, Jesus' brothers were there, and that's interesting. So we presume that once Jesus resurrected, maybe that's when his brother said, okay, I I guess he was right the whole time. Um, Now that they're on board, though, James will eventually become the leader of the church. So it's possible that they came to faith much earlier than this. We know they weren't believers at the the time that they showed up in Capernaum. They're knocking on the door, and Jesus says, you know, these are my brothers. Uh, But at at some point, they would have had to come to faith. I I think James would have had to earn that leadership position. I think it's unlikely that a newbie, just a few days, (laughs) a believer would be uh, elevated to the position of leader. So in any case, the the good news is at some point, uh, James and Jude, the author of the book of Jude, came to to faith in their half-brother. At this time, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. A group of about 120 people was there together. And he said, Brothers, the scripture has had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in the ministry." So rooms really weren't that big. So even 120 people might have been a really tight fit, and that's going to be important when we get to Acts chapter 2. I'll have a point to to make about the probable location for where those events took place in the next lesson. The Dead Sea Scrolls make a reference to really a formal representative uh, for every 10 people. So it's curious that there are exactly 120 people present when Peter makes the comment that they are one short of 12, and, and do they need it? a 12th person. Peter is paraphrasing Psalm 41, 9. Even my close friend whom I trusted who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And so the fact that Judas was prophesied to do what he did uh, doesn't excuse what he did, but it, it definitely says that his role was foretold. Verse 18, now this man, Judas, acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his intestines gushed out. Really nice picture there. And it became known to all the residents of Jerusalem. As a result, his field was called Hakel Dama. Dam is the word for blood. In their own language, that is the field of blood. <laughs> 
This tradition uh, of the Field of Blood is located on the southeast side of the city. It's very close to where the Kidron and Hinnom Valleys come together. And th there's a hill there that's called the Hill of Offense. And it goes way back to when some unsavory things were taking place there. But what is kind of funny is that this is where the United Nations building is today. And so some, some find that uh, quite ironic and, and quite humorous. Older commentaries saw these verses as Peter's words. More modern scholarship would see this as an insertion by Luke. Um, there are some differences between this account and the one in Matthew 27 that talks about the end of Judas. To some people, these are problematic, but I don't think they need to be. We've talked before about how two witnesses, their, their stories don't have to line up precisely. And just because they don't doesn't mean one or the other is not being truthful. Matthew says the is you know, Judas threw the money on the ground and the temple folks bought the field, but Luke says Judas bought the field. So this could be two different reckonings. Maybe they had two different sources, sources, or is Luke employing a euphemism? Like, you know, we say bought the farm today. We don't really mean literally buying a, a literal farm. So uh, there could be some wordplay going on here. In ancient stories, it was common to portray the wicked as being so bad or even so obese that the rope broke when they tried to hang themselves. So Luke may be kind of playing on that here. Although improbable, maybe Judas's rope did break and, and he did fall face down after he tried to hang himself. So in any case, I don't think we need to assume contradictory stories. We just don't have enough facts to make that conclusion. And I'm really curious to see how The Chosen is going to portray this, uh, this rather grizz, grisly episode. Dr. Boland doesn't see any contradiction, though, between Luke and Matthew, and he, he does this based on the geography. If you look toward, toward the middle of the picture, you see the shadow, and that's, that means there's a really steep cliff that runs right through there. And, and so Dr. Boland writes, steep cliffs, steep cliffs run along the southern side of the Hinnom Valley, adjacent to the traditional location of Judas's suicide. Today, marked by the monastery, uh, it is easy to imagine Judas dangling from a rope over these cliffs before the rope snapped and his body plunged into the rocks below where it burst open. So maybe uh, maybe both are true. And Peter is actually asking a question here. It's not real clear to us, but uh, he's going to quote two different Psalms that are a little bit, uh, they, they, they paint two different pictures. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his residence be made desolate and may there be none living it. And may another take his office. So what he's saying here, and it's not really clear to us, but he says there is biblical support for leaving Judas's place vacant, effectively as if he never existed, but there's also biblical support for replacing him. The support for not replacing him comes from Psalm 69. May there can't be desolated, may there be none living, for they have persecuted whom you yourself struck, and they tell the pain, basically, you know, bad people, and we're gonna we're gonna write them off as as wicked. May they be wiped out of the book of life, may they be not recorded with the righteous. In support of replacing Judas, there is Psalm 109. So they have repaid me evil for good and, and hatred for my love. Very much the same pronouncement on, on the wicked. But verse 6 says, Appoint a wicked person over him, and an accuser may stand. When he is judged, he may come guilty. May his days be few, and may another take his office. And then it goes on, May his child be fatherless and his wife a widow. So you're pronouncing a curse, but this verse is saying, Well, take appoint someone righteous to take his place. So which is it? What's it going to be? These are men and women in that room, 120 of them, that knew how to be Bereans. They didn't just pick one verse that, that, that agreed with their position and run with it. They said, wait a minute, this is not so simple. We, we've got to reason this out. And note that these verses are not necessarily prophesying of Judas' betrayal, but Peter is citing them as legal precedents. Uh, if this is true, you know, whoever the person writing the psalm was talking about, how much more is it true of the one who actually betrayed the Messiah? So what I think happened is between verse 20 and 21, they prayed and they prayed and led by the spirit, they came to a decision that yes, they need to replace this position. So Peter continues verse 21, therefore it is necessary of that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So the candidate for replacement, A, a we're going to replace the candidate. You know, they, they've agreed on that. They also come up with four very specific criteria. He had to be baptized by John, which is kind of fascinating. Uh, John was imprisoned early on. So these, this is someone who was there at the beginning that has to take his place. 
Uh, he's been with Jesus during his ministry, witnessed the resurrection, and is capable of testifying and teaching basically in an authoritative manner. They had to be called as an apostle with the additional requirement that they had to be baptized by John. And so, I, like I said, I find that interesting. I think this implies that all of the original 12, not just James and Andrew, they might have all been John's apostles, John's disciples. And it's, if, it's an interesting thought. If not, they were all definitely baptized by John uh, because otherwise they couldn't make this requirement of the replacement to be baptized by John. This is a picture of the garden tomb in Jerusalem, and it commemorates the empty tomb of Jesus. The sign on the door, he is not here, he is risen, is quoting Matthew 28, verse 6, and that's uh, what the angels told uh, the, the women as they witnessed the resurrection. So the garden tomb is unlikely to be the actual location of the resurrection, but it is a beautifully preserved area, and it's a beautiful garden, and it's just an amazing place for worship and reflection. So uh, we'll, we'll try and visit there when we go to, uh, to, go to Israel. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and uh, Matthias. So we don't know whether these were the only two who met all four criteria or whether they are just the best two who made the short list. But in any case, again, we presume they had much prayer and maybe some spirited debate. They landed on these two, Barsabbas and Matthias. I'm sure either one would have been fine if they met all those criteria. Church tradition is very, very kind to both men. They're not mentioned again, neither one of them, uh, after Acts 1, but uh, they're, they're both recorded as doing some great things for the early church. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, know the hearts of all people. Show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas had turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the, seven, to the eleven apostles. So potentially they resorted to lots, which is similar to casting die or flipping a coin, because they really couldn't come to an agreement on one or the other. It was, it was a, a true tie, a, a true equal. So in other words, after debate, they couldn't, you know, couldn't land on one, so they basically decided to flip a coin. But a very important note, they asked God to direct the outcome of the coin flip, and casting lots was a really a biblically sanctioned way of seeking the Lord's, uh, Lord's guidance. It's kind of unusual for us today to think about that, uh, but that's just kind of how that procedure worked back in that day. So we're, we need to remember, we're not to abdicate discernment and flip a coin, you know, to, to make any big decision. Uh, very infrequently will we be presented with two exactly equal choices. And when we are, it may not really matter which one we pick, just as long as we pick one that, you know, we can confirm is in God's will. But in this unique and limited situation, they weren't hearing anything else. This is what they did. And they trusted that it was God's decision. And I said, uh, uh, the tradition says they both were, were used mightily in, in the early church. So as we mentioned in the intro, though, we know very little about the Acts of the Apostles, even though that's the name of the book, other than Peter and Paul and maybe a little bit about Philip and his mission to Samaria. I'm, I'm sure they will all have great stories to tell as we sit around one day and, and around a heavenly campfire listening to them uh, tell of all, all the works that they did. I'm kind of looking forward to that. So that's it for chapter one. Next time we'll be in Acts chapter two, and we'll see you then. Yeah.